So I am Shannon Moody with Kentucky Youth Advocates. And Kentucky Youth Advocates is the backbone organization of the COSAIR Charity Space Center Movement. And the COSAIR Charity Space Center Movement's goal is to end child abuse and neglect in the Commonwealth uh, through partnership and through a focus on policy, best practice, and community education and awareness building. So we have an opportunity today um, and really throughout the month of April to lift up particular topics that folks are interested in in relation to child abuse and neglect. So it's a, you know, child abuse and neglect is obviously a very complex issue. It's got a big, broad scope. And there are a lot of different ways that we can address it and work towards keeping kids safe and keeping families connected. Um, in order to, to do that and, and really focus in today on um, reporting, but also kind of the other factors around reporting of child abuse and neglect, we really want to dig into some of those nuances today. And we would really like to hear from the panel that we have assembled in order to do that. So we will be talking today about, uh, again, uh, you know, reporting of child abuse and neglect, but really what does it look like before? What does it look like during? What does it look like after? And how do we maintain connections with parents and, and children in very stressful situations? So I, um, I'll again, I'll remind you, if you could please place yourself on mute during the duration of the meeting, that would be awesome. And we will jump right into questions. So we're going to start um, with really brief introductions from our panelists who are phenomenal folks, and then we will get into the specific questions. So I will kick it to Rainey to start us off with introductions, and then we'll go around and, and get into questions. Hi, um, my name is Rainey Minikin. I work for Fayette County Public Schools in Lexington as the Associate Director of Student Support Services, which means I coordinate um, our school counselors, mental health specialists, social workers, and social emotional learning curriculum. Thanks for being here, Rainey. Jeff, would you like to go? Absolutely. Thank you for allowing me in this space. My name is Jeff Austin. I work for Louisville Metro Government in the Healthy Start Program. Uh, I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for the 502 Fathers Program, which we provide resources and support to dads because sometimes dads get forgotten. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here, Jeff. Valerie? Morning, everyone. I'm Valerie Frost. I'm here today as a mom. I have children under five. I've also used community services, and I've been on the receiving end of reporting, so I'm here to share that perspective. Thanks, Valerie. And Krista? Good morning. I'm Krista Bell. I'm an executive advisor with the Department for Community-Based Services. Um, I focus primarily on the department's prevention efforts, um, but I've been with the agency for a little over 25 years, um, almost uh, the entirety of that time uh, working in child welfare. Krista, we really appreciate you being here today. And um, I know you're bringing a lot of knowledge and experience to the table. So we're actually going to start with you. And then obviously our panelists, we'd love for you to jump in and comment as Krista shares her, um, it shares her wisdom and, and information. But we, we wanted to start with some, some kind of basic questions for folks who maybe are not familiar with the process. So Krista, can you talk a little bit about what happens when a report is made to Child Protective Services? And in that process, where do you see bias as a potential challenge? Sure. So when a report is made um, to the agency, we have um, centralized intake staff who um, are trained to screen those reports and compare whatever information is reported to the agency to the statutory definitions um, of abuse or neglect. So for um, the agency on the child protection side to be able to um, provide any type of services or, um, you know, to work to assess safety and risk with the family, the information that is reported to the agency um, has to align with what those statutory definitions of abuse and neglect might be. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of um, probably missed opportunity in that. And probably a lot of people don't realize that the vast majority of reports that come in 
um, to the child uh, protection centralized intake staff do not meet those uh, statutory definitions. Um, and so uh, like last year, last calendar year, less than 34% um, of the reports that came in actually were accepted uh, for DCBS to provide uh, services, uh, child protection services. Um, and so today, uh, you know, sometimes whoever is making that report um, is given, you know, alternate resources, uh, but we don't do a great job really as a system of connecting um, families uh, to, to resources in a meaningful way um, when they uh, don't screen in uh, for uh, on the child protection side. So I think there's a lot of missed opportunity um, there. Um, Shannon, I also heard you say the word um, bias. Um, so I think it's a good opportunity we um, to bring up what we do in terms of looking at um, data around um, disproportionality. So we look at um, the breakdown um, by race and ethnicity at every decision point um, within our system, starting with that with reports that are received. Uh, and that is actually where we see the greatest disproportionality um, is where are the reports that are due to the agency. Um, so for example, um, African-Americans are black uh, children make up approximately 9% of our general population, um, but that represents 12.5% of the reports that are received on the front end to the child protection agency. So the department is looking at that as soon as a call is made and a report comes in, they're starting to track and figure out um, not just geographically, but uh, race, ethnicity, um, and then probably some other factors like age and, and other demographics. So um, Krista, I know that the Department for Community-Based Services and the work that you all have been doing, you've been focused on and really have, have some concerted efforts around prevention and, and looking at that primary and secondary prevention. Um, and I think what we hear a lot about is that connection to poverty. So I think a lot of people feel overwhelmed with the idea of child abuse and neglect and keeping kids safe and then look at you know, look at sometimes distilling it into to two or, or three major issues, poverty, or it's the parents, or it's the, so can you talk a little bit about how poverty plays a role in, um, in child abuse and neglect, and then also helping to differentiate or how you all are differentiating that with, with neglect? Sure. And so national um, research and uh, data at the national level would indicate that for families um, living, living in poverty, they are much more likely to come to the attention of the child welfare agency. They are much more likely to have a substantiation of neglect. They're also um, more likely to have a substantiation of physical abuse. However, poverty is not neglect. Um, and up until the passage of Senate Bill 8 uh, in this legislative session, Kentucky was one of the states that um, in its statutory definition of neglect did not clearly um, differentiate um, between poverty and neglect. But it's a really important distinction because there's a big difference between a parent not having um, access to the resources that they need um, to be able to, you know, pay a utility bill versus a parent choosing not to provide for whatever reason, um, basic necessities for their child. And, it, and it's an important distinction that we need um, to make because how you meet those needs is really different depending on that distinction. And so with the passage of Senate Bill 8, um, Kentucky's definition of neglect has now changed. Um, so it adds the language uh, to, to distinguish when a family is financially able to do so, or um, if those basic needs are, are still not met once um, they have been connected to resources and supports. So a lot of other states have that in their statutory definition already. So I do see that as a, a positive step in the right direction um, that really will give us much more um, flexibility in how we are able to uh, meet the needs of families in, in their communities. Um, and again, it's just an important distinction uh, to make because while 
you know, poverty certainly puts children and families um, at risk. Um, we want to be, be sure that we're serving uh, families um, in a way that speaks to the, to the well-being of the family, to the well-being of the children um, whenever we possibly can, rather than in ways that are punitive. Um, and so it's really important that we're looking at how we address poverty um, separate from um, always calling that neglect. I think um, as a school district in partnership with the cabinet over the past 25 years or so, that's where family resource use service centers really come into play to, to, to be partners with the family. Um, their goal is to eliminate barriers to education. You know, they are a school-based program, but often those barriers are access to resources um, for the family. And so that is that is their goal, their purpose, and often um, if their work is impeded, then they're unable to really um, prevent some of the negative fallout of poverty. Um, so, you know, any time, regardless of what your role is in working with children and families, anytime you can connect them with a family resource use service center coordinator, they're going to be able to, in turn, support the parents, connect them with those resources, um, all to keep them out of um, the protective service system, because ultimately that, that's the goal. We want our families to flourish independent of the system. That is awesome. Um, you know, sitting again, thank you for allowing me in this space, just to give you a brief background of my professional experience. Um, 2002, I started as a therapeutic staff supporter where uh, I was assigned a student and I had to go to school and kind of be um, their personal assistant to make sure there were no behavior outbursts and so forth. Uh, left there and went into a provider agency where we did sexual abuse cases and home protective services. And uh, this was all in the city of Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. And one of the programs that I was, uh, I had a huge impact was, it was called Servicing Children in Their Own Home. Um, the Department of Human Services would deem uh, a particular situation as um, potentially maybe removing the kids from home because things aren't kind of where they need to be. My responsibility was if I was assigned a case and they put me in a case, it was to empower the family and ensure that the safety plan was being followed and the family would remain intact. So having said that, um, somebody said uh, connecting with the resources, it, it was always, and I had to learn, and this is over 20 years of doing this type of work, I had to learn that you have to also look with a big uh, scope to make sure that you're looking at everything. If um, little Jeff comes to uh, class and it's winter and he doesn't have a coat, did he forget the coat? Do they have a coat? Uh, did he refuse to wear a coat? Or what is the case versus just saying, um, a teacher seeing a, a student coming in and it's snowing or something and it's like, oh my God, we're going to uh, report them to uh, Child Protective Services, as opposed to saying, let me make a phone call or utilize the services within the school to say, can somebody reach out to the family and say, hey, uh, little Jeff uh, arrived without a coat and we want to ensure that everything is, his needs are being met versus saying, uh, little Jeff didn't arrive without a coat. We already called DHS and they're sending somebody out to uh, see what is going on. Um, my approach was always, you catch more bees with honey than you do vinegar. Um, my, my absolute job is to report as a mandated reporter and I'll let the family know up front, like I have to report this if there is something that we can't resolve or there's no resource to uh, support you. However, if there are needs that you're having this is the time for you to uh, talk to me about it and let's see if we can work this out. So my number one thing, whether it's in-home protective services, whether it's in school, whether it's in, uh, I was a program director at a community center, it's building these relationships and don't assume. Always build relationships and don't assume. So um, everybody in this wonderful space, everybody that is watching, um, I encourage you to build relationships, no matter what your program is or what you're doing. It's about building these relationships, not only with the clients, but the people that are providing services so you know that you're all on the same page and you're moving in the same direction. 
So um, if you take anything away from this uh, panel discussion and anything away from me, um, anybody can tell you I am all about relationships. I am not perfect. Nobody I serve is perfect. However, there is a relationship that we can build to work to a common goal, which is to ensure that the children, the family remains intact. So that's, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thanks for that, Jeff. And I, I, that certainly speaks to what we're going to continue um, discussing with, within this panel for sure. Um, so let's talk about uh, something that you said really briefly, though, is you talked about being a mandated reporter. And in Kentucky, every adult is a mandated reporter. Um, Kentucky, uh, it's not the case in every state, but that is the case in Kentucky. And that means that if you're an adult and you suspect um, abuse and neglect of a child, uh, you are required by law to make a report. Um, and I want to talk about that from the whole panel's perspective. What are some of the benefits, if you've had to make a report, what, what are some of the benefits of making that report? Well, um, for me, over the past uh, 20 plus years working with children and adolescents, I've had to make numerous reports. Um, and it's, it's never fun um, for me, uh, never a positive feeling, but often the outcomes can be positive. The, the goal is for the student, in, in my case in schools, for the children and youth to be in safe environments where their needs are being met. Um, and so sometimes that the, the outcome is that it propels a parent to get treatment for substance abuse um, it, through the services and supports provided by um, the Cabinet for Families and Children. They're, they're able to um, find employment, job skills, get wraparound supports that they need. And at times, um, they are unable to see the benefit of accessing those until they get that more intensive support. Yeah, my experience is, is never, um, I have never been uh, treated like it was positive, like, thank you for making that report. Um, I've had families that were really upset with me. Um, but what I assured them, and, and hopefully um, the people that are serving these people in whatever uh, uh, avenue that you're working in, that it's a, um, it's a team effort. It's like, look, I had to report it. I'm a mandated reporter. It's my responsibility, my goals. Um, they're coming out. They're going to do an investigation. I am still going to be a part of this, and we're going to resolve this together. Uh, it's going to take effort on my part. It's going to take effort on the parent's part. But what I try to assure them, and I hope that everybody does the same thing, is that you're not alone. This is a, an attempt to uh, rectify a situation to allow the family to remain intact, but also to give the child a, a solid foundation to uh, thrive and do everything that a child should be able to do. So, um, yeah, it's never a good feeling. And, and it's, it's, you know, sometimes it's emotional. But, I mean, we're humans, and that's just a natural a natural reaction to some of these things, you have to do it. And, and once you do it, it's like, I'm not just going to report and just, you know, walk away from the situation. Like if they pull me off the case, that's one thing. But if I'm still involved and I'm like, look, um, I got a report from the school. I went and talked to the school counselor. I uh, had a conversation with a teacher. And this is a reoccurring event, a uh, reoccurring situation. We have to address this and you need some additional support. And this is what the report was made so they can send you resources as opposed to having, um, I've had many, many workers and I've been on many cases where they came in and they came in very hot and saying, hey, if I, if you, if this doesn't happen in this week, this doesn't happen in this week, you miss an appointment, this, that, and the third, I am going to file for placement, which means that I'm going to remove your kids from your house until these things are resolved. My thing is, let's go in and, and try to work together versus coming in, um, I, I want to kind of say good cop, bad cop, but um, it's always about the support. So regardless of who's reporting and who's sharing that information, the ultimate goal is to remain intact, empower the family, 
and to make sure that the kids are getting what they need. And I'll, I'll just add uh, a couple of thoughts came to mind. Um, based on what Rainey and Jeff have already said. I think um, certainly we, we have um, programs and practices, evidence-based practices in Kentucky, such as our START program, our K-STEP program, um, uh, uh, VOA uh, services that um, are very effective uh, for families um, where addiction, substance use disorder are a contributing issue. Um, and uh, although that uh, that report doesn't feel good at the time that it's happened. I don't think that there's any family that, you know, would thank the reporter for making that report on that day. Um, there are so many wonderful stories about how families have been um, healed through those services. Um, and, and we, the SART program, for example, even uh, has a uh, peer mentor component. So, you know, we have a number of families who uh, were uh, served through Child Protective Services, uh, through substance use disorder services previously, and now serve as peer mentors uh, to other families struggling with the same issue. So I think that there are uh, good things certainly that come of that mandatory reporting. Uh, our other prevention services, so even um, when neglect, let me back up for a second, even when neglect and abuse is substantiated, uh, most children are not removed from their family. So uh, many of those families, actually the larger percentage of those families are served with in-home services uh, through formal uh, prevention services, which are pretty intensive services with a um, contracted provider coming into the home and working with that family, um, either on you know, substance use disorder um, issues, uh, mental health issues, uh, in-home parenting skills, and those services are roughly 93% effective um, across all of our programs and keeping children safely at home with those families. So I think those are other examples of families that um, that are examples of, you know, something good coming of that uh, report. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily involve removal. I think that's what a lot of people uh, think of when they think of child protective services. Um, but most families, even when there's a substantiation of abuse or neglect are served uh, while their children remain uh, in the home with them as long as those immediate safety threats um, can be uh, addressed. Yeah, so I'm hearing a lot of connections to supports, services, potentially addressing some underlying issues like mental health or substance use issues of the parents or caregivers. Um, so when, when thinking about making a report, um, that certainly, and I, and I think probably a lot of folks intent, right? They want to help get that family connected and that child supported and in a situation that they're safe or children. Um, let's talk a little bit about the other side of it as far as like, potential unintended consequences or, or perceived um, challenges as a result of a report. Valerie, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, I had to leave the, the positives to the professionals because, uh, you know, what you just said, intent. So everyone that spoke before me, they all were talking about the intentions of someone that is making the report, which are well-meaning. Obviously, we all want to keep children safe. Um, but there's the other side of, of what's on it, what happens. Um, and so, you know, I was listening to Krista and she was explaining the process of what happens when there's a report. And, you know, something that stood out to me was just, you know, she mentioned that if there's not a substantiation, you know, you don't get access to the same services. Um, and that's, I think that's what people are, are missing sometimes. So I was on Facebook the other day and I saw my local community, I saw some moms chatting and one mom had seen something that she didn't like. And everybody else was like, everyone in Kentucky is a mandated reporter, report it, report it. They will, the DCBS will get to the bottom of it and everything will be fine. And, you know, my thought to that was, you know, they don't know what happens when the call is made because when DCBS gets the call and they decide to go out there, they're there just to see if the child is safe. That's what they're doing. So, it really does kind of become like, are you guilty? Yes or no. And that's what you feel when someone comes to you. This person is trying to determine if I am guilty of child abuse or neglect. So I know Jeff was talking about good cop, bad cop. Some people may do it better than others. The experience can be different. 
Um, but then at the end of it, you just get this letter and it's like, no, unsubstantiated. And it just feels like, well, we didn't find anything here. But you just went through this whole ordeal of somebody questioning you, wondering if you're a bad parent, judging you. You know, they start asking you questions about other things. They may have come because, like Jeff said, maybe there wasn't a coat that day. So they came to see, you know, why is there a coat? I'm going to look in the closet and see if y'all have coats. While we're here, we're going to look in your fridge and see if there's food. And we're going to look and see if you have child safety locks on things. And it just kind of keeps going and going. Um, and then, you know, when you do get that letter, okay, unsubstantiated, then it's like, okay, well, I, they didn't find anything. And it's, it, you would think it would be a relief, but it's really not, you know, because it's like, you just went through this whole thing where somebody was trying to find a reason to say that you're not a good parent and parenting is hard in itself. You know, it's difficult. And they might not have known that the day that coat wasn't worn at school, like Jeff said, was it because the child is autistic and has sensory issues and refused to put this coat on? And you take this child to therapy every week and you're really on top of it. And that's a battle that you chose just to, to give up. You know, you, you got the child to eat something and a new food and they have sensory stuff. And that was like a big win. Um, it could have just been you were running really late and didn't want to get marks down late again, because that's a whole nother issue when you rack up all these lates that drop off in the morning. So it's like, let's just get out because we're just going to park in the parking lot and go in the building anyway. And the coat's like the last thing that needs to be worried about. Let's just get to school on time. So, I mean, you know, Jeff was talking about getting to know people and that's really important because if you actually had a relationship with the family, you would know what was going on. You would know that, oh, this child always has a coat and something must have happened today. or Maybe one of the parents lost a job recently and you're like, oh, maybe they're kind of, you know, they're struggling a little bit right now, but it's not like they the ongoing abuse and neglect. It's just kind of like a temporary situation. And, you know, let me have some grace for them because it, it's, it's been a hard time or, you know, that's what, you know, but um, I want to say too, even like unintended consequences, once you go through that experience, it, it stays with you. Now, like you can feel it all the time that people are watching you and, you know, if you mess up or you have a bad day, that's what's going to happen is somebody's going to come to your house and go through your drawers and go through your fridge, ask you questions. Um, so then it, it, it's like isolating, I guess you don't really want to ask for help anymore. Because now it's like, if I let you know that maybe we don't have as much food this week, is this going to happen again? Are you going to send somebody to look in my fridge? Is it okay to ask for help now? Um, yeah, I don't know. That, that part's really hard. Um, and then also, Krista was talking about poverty and neglect. So when you do live in, in poverty, you're, there's more eyes on you for people that can see things like that. Because you may be going to like, the health department for your, you know, healthcare. And that's like big open, a lot of people in and out like a community building. Whereas like, maybe if you have like private healthcare, you had just have like a small office and, and your physician, um, you may just be at community centers more using public services. You may be living in public housing so they can watch you. Um, so it kind of feels like you're under surveillance more and especially when you're asking for help with utilities and all that, you're just constantly facing these robots where people are watching you and determining, are you asking for utility support because you are making bad choices and you don't have the money? Whereas if you just paid your bills, you had enough money to pay for it, people wouldn't have as many eyes on you and watch and scrutinize you as much. Yeah, and, and Valerie, what I hear you talking about is trust of the system, right? Like there are, there's a, there's a varying degree of, of people who trust the system or don't trust the system or if, who have had previous experiences that have not, um, have not called people in or been inclusive, but have been isolating. So knowing that child abuse and neglect absolutely happens, we know that that happens in Kentucky. Um, we also have to balance that with, um, you know, not, not making reports on, on people 
based on one singular judgment or one particular incidence, because we're hearing about the, the need for that relationship building and development, um, you know, considering the safety and potential risks to the relationship, how do you still go about reporting if you are certain or you, th- or you think that a child is at risk um, while still attempting to maintain that relationship? What does that, what does that look like? Gosh, well, Jeff talked about this a little bit. Um, I mean, there are certainly circumstances where you're going to have to make a report. And I think he talked about when you do provide services or you do connect families and they're not taking it and you reach out and reach out and they are just refusing, um, you know, there, there has to be a point where you have to make that judgment call. This is not going anywhere. And this child is still in a in a bad situation. Um, but I really appreciated that he said that he lets people know. I think that's really important. Just don't blindside someone. Um, cause it's really a lot to sit in your house and have someone come knock on your door. Um, and if, and then also with the professional, then you have to wonder, okay, well, I went to the doctor's office this week. I was at the grocery store and my child was crying at the grocery store. My child goes to school every day. Then you're just, you're replaying every interaction that you had, which one of these people, maybe they made a face or a comment that I missed that day. Were they the ones that called, um, you know, it can spiral. And I think at least letting people know, Hey, I've been trying to help you. I've been trying to help your family. And that too is important. I think focusing on the family and not just beelining like this child, unless it's really just you know, you're positive that, that the parent is choosing to harm this child on purpose. Now that's a different situation. You may need to call the police, but, um, otherwise if it's something, you know, like with the coat, if you know, the family needs financial support, helping the family helps the child. So it's not beneficial to ignore the parents. Um, but yeah, I think not blindsiding them, letting them know, talking them through it. And I really do think as well, um, try try not to convey any judgment. I know that's really hard when you're telling someone you're concerned, but, um, you know, I heard Krista was talking about people that have really been served, uh, by the services and people that have come back and and said that it helps them. And I think if you, if you can connect someone with something that they need, obviously in the moment, like Jeff said, people are not happy. They are not going to be happy that this happened to them. But if someone's life is changed and they really do get help, you know, parents that love their children and want to have successful family, they're going to appreciate that. And it may not be that day or that month, but, you know, I I think it's important if you don't burn the bridge by doing it in a way that severs the ties and, and, you know, makes them feel so embarrassed to talk to you. And Jeff said he tries to, to stay in the loop. He tries to follow up with people and stay available I think that's important. Stay available. So when they have that moment that, you know, I didn't appreciate that, that interaction, but our lives are better. My children are, are happier and safer and, and we're all thriving and they can come back and talk to you. And, and then you've built that, that trust. You kind of paid a deposit for trust for later. Now they can come back and say, you know what, Jeff really did help my family. And, and he was really, he really did what he needed to do. And I, I maybe I wasn't with myself at that moment. And I actually need something now. I don't want to take a risk on a new professional because they might not be so understanding. Let me go back to him because he really did do right by my family. Valerie, thank you so much for sharing. <clears throat> um, it, ju- it just made me think about uh, instances where I had to report. Um, I was super transparent. I always try to be transparent. Uh, when I was assigned a particular case and the mom had uh, substance abuse issues, Um, it was imperative that she kept doctor's appointments and I would meet her at the doctor. And if I would show up and she wasn't there, I would go back to her house. Um, and it occurred like maybe two or three times. Uh, I let her know, I gave her car, you know, car fare. So she didn't have an excuse to say I couldn't get there. And then I told her, listen, we're going to have a a visit coming up. I gave her the date, the time that I was going to be there. And when I arrived, uh, she was living with her father so um, the child's grandfather, he was there. Uh, the baby was in the uh, play, uh, pack and play. I remember this vividly. 
uh, the baby was in the pack and play. And I'm like, well, where's mom? And he was like, well, she just walked out a minute ago. And what she did was she walked out and went around the corner to get whatever she was going to get. And when she came back, I said, listen, you know, we've been through this quite, you know, quite a few times. And this is the last straw. I can't do this anymore. I am getting ready to make a report and we're going to see what the next steps are. So um, she was upset and she was very upset with me. But my, again, my customer was the child. I had to ensure that that child was going to be taken care of. So long story short, that day the child got placed, um, maybe a month or two later, I get a letter in the mail and I get a picture of the baby now with a relative. And the relative wrote me a letter and said, thank you for making that report um, it was difficult. We're appreciative. The child is now doing well and the mom is now in rehab. So um, regardless of the consequences, I have been cussed out. I've been yelled at um, all types of stuff. It doesn't matter to me. My job is to ensure that the child is safe and not being neglected or, or you know, um, abused or anything like that. So what Valerie said is, is true. Each worker that is doing this work in this field, you're not represent, not only representing yourself, the uh, organization that you're working for, but you're representing all the mandated reporters, all the child care providers, all the friskies in the schools. There, um, and it's it's nothing you can do about it. It's just circumstances. I, I want I want to say that to say um, everybody in this space. I'm sure that you're an ultimate professional, and I appreciate everything you're doing for everybody that you're working with. But just know that you're part of this bigger machine, this bigger team that when I step in and they're like, oh, here, here comes a social worker. He's coming to remove the kids. No, I'm coming to empower the family and to provide resources. And hopefully everybody that is going to come behind me, before me, uh, later on is going to uh, uh, kind of resemble the same attitude and the same position. Because social services, it's a... It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a culture. It's like, you know, we're here to provide for people and to serve. And what Valerie was saying, everybody on here, just take a second and imagine somebody knocking on your door saying that they got a report about something that's going on in your house or something that's going on with your child. How would you feel? Like if somebody knocked on my door, I would be livid. However, I know that they're doing their job. So now let's look at this as the, the big picture and see how we can resolve this to make sure that everybody remains intact. And, and I'll, I, I'll, I'll jump in too, because I'd like to respond to a couple of things that um, Valerie said, because I think, um, you know, after the report as a child protection agency, I mean, considering everything, you know, Valerie said, you know, with regard to how families experience that, I think we have to listen to that and identify what the opportunities are to do better um, because it, it doesn't uh, create greater safety for children. It doesn't uh, serve the goal of prevention if our approach makes families less likely to reach out and ask for support or help when they need that. And so I think we have to think about how our approach and how the system um, operates so that it so that help seeking behavior because every family every family uh, at some point in time needs extra support every family has stressors every family experiences hard times it applies to all families and we can't create a culture and a system that makes it uh, hard for families to acknowledge or you know let someone know that they need some additional support. Uh, because they're they're afraid of what the consequence of that is going to be. So um, one of the things that we're working on at DCBS is changing the way that we respond to those um, reports. So today in Kentucky, we have a one size fits all approach that you heard Valerie um, describe. So whether, you know, the report comes in is that you know, the family doesn't have any electricity and no food in the refrigerator, we respond to that exactly the same way as a sexual abuse um, report. Well, sexual abuse is a mandated joint report with law enforcement, but our approach to how we assess uh, safety and risk is exactly the same uh, for, you know, sort of a low risk neglect report uh, versus a high risk physical abuse or sexual abuse um, report. 
um, where many other states are using a system of um, alternative response that is not completely focused on fact finding all the time that's not completely focused on whether this is going to be substantiated or unsubstantiated so for those things that come to the attention of the agency um, that are lower risk it really allows the agency to partner with those families to work with those families to identify um, their own needs there's not a substantiation at the end the families just get connected to services um, that they that they may need based on what they say their needs are based on you know what they identify um, as their challenges and their strengths so we are looking to implement that um, very soon and i think that over time that will make um, a really big difference in terms of how families experience that report uh, in terms of how families um, experience services after the report is made and i hope that that um, you know eventually starts to make a difference in terms of families uh, comfort and you know to what valerie said not feeling like um, you know everyone is surveilling them all the time and trying to identify what they're doing wrong and that families will be more comfortable you know seeking help and seeking support when they need that and and we know um, as mentioned earlier that a lot of families while it's hard to seek help see the family resource use service centers and the schools as a as a potential source for that um, and we also know that schools are one of the biggest reporting sources of uh, child abuse and neglect. And I, I wanted to hear from Rainey a bit about, um, with that being the case where schools are, are oftentimes a community hub, but then oftentimes um, the, the biggest reporting source, how do schools talk to their staff about reporting? And um, how do they talk to them about the, the relationship building and, and supporting? Great question. So obviously um, we are mandated reporters as, as folks in the education system. So each year we review that obligation um, with our school faculty and staff. However, um, it's really imperative that those of us in the, the student support work, um, which would include the frisks and counselors and social workers, that we really emphasize to the staff um, the importance of, A, we don't conduct the investigation ourselves, um, but B, consulting, you know, are there resources that can meet this need re rather than just be a knee-jerk reaction and making the phone call? So in, um, in our schools, sort of an informal procedure that we have is that any staff that has those concerns comes to the student support team those counselors, frisks, et cetera, before making the report um, to determine, is this a need that could be met um, through partnering with the family um, rather than making a report to try to push the family into to getting that need met? Need met. Um, I think too, that that can help um, eliminate some of those biases that can occur um, by having a small, you know, sort of let's bounce this off each other process rather than it being a, this is my, I have to report, I don't like this, and I'm going to make a call. Um, the other piece too um, with all of this is that we have to view families as partners um, in the education and well being of our students. And so to do that, they can't be just this outsider. Um, which due to COVID has really been the case <laughs> until recently, but someone that we bring into the building or that we reach out to um, and try to make them feel both welcome and supported in their role as, as the um, foundational educator of their child, but also let them know about the resources that are available in a way that isn't judgmental, but it's available to everyone, um, in, including our school staff. You know, school staff run into um, those difficult times where it's hard to pay a bill or um, we're unable to find safe childcare for our kids. So letting them know too, this is for everyone, it's for our community. Um, you know, these resources, these opportunities to connect with providers that can support you in meeting need X, Y, or Z. Um, but I think it's imperative that from the outset of any relationship with a parent, 
that it's a positive one, that it's a supportive one, and never that, well, I'm the educator, so I'm the expert on your child and what he or she needs. Absolutely not. The parent is the expert on that child. Um, so unless the risk is imminent to the, the student's safety, it's really important that instead we reach out to partner um, and you know ask how we can help um, before we make those reports. And I, and I think that varies individual to individual how likely they are um, to make that their response, but the more aware an educator is of the internal resources to connect with external resources, um, the better. So um, it's really on those student support folks to educate the individuals in their building um, about the role they can play. That was excellent. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, and Rainy, I think you hit on a topic that's really important related to like how how do you decide when it's connecting to services or when it's making that report or when it's both? And I would love to hear a little bit from Krista, um, like based on your perspective with, with the Department for Community-Based Services, what does that look like for you all? Sure, and it's, it's a really um, challenging but really important conversation. Um, there's a lot of conversation and information on the national level that, you know, we have really uh, paid attention to and watching what other states are doing, um, sort of this terminology of, of shifting from mandated reporter to mandated supporter. Uh, but it, it's a it's a hard conversation to have because the last thing that we don't want it to be misunderstood. Right. So I don't want anybody to leave uh, this uh, conversation today and say that lady from the cabinet said that we shouldn't report child abuse and neglect because that's not what we're saying. I think it's really about being thoughtful about what really is suspected abuse and neglect and what is as rating was um, describing, you know, a family who needs additional support. And I appreciated so much what she said is that parent knows best what that parent needs. A family knows best what a family needs. So we're not all experts on what families need. Um, and I think, I think historically there has been so much emphasis on that mandatory reporting. And it's, it, it's very well intended because no one wants a child to be abused or neglected. We all care about children. We all share those concerns. Um, and I think if you go back, you know, 30 years, there wasn't as much general awareness about child abuse and neglect and really hitting that hard was really important. But I think we're in a different space now. And I think we're in a space to be more thoughtful about how we come around families and how we support family and child um, well-being. We're not in the same place we were in 1980 or 1990, where, you know, we really needed to beat the drum and make people aware that child abuse and neglect existed. We, we all know today that that exists, but every struggle that you see a family having is not abuse or neglect. Sometimes those families just need additional resources and support. And I think, you know, once you have made, if you're a community partner, or you, even if you're a next door neighbor or a family member, you know, if you see a family struggling, I, unless it's, you know, something obviously like physical abuse or sexual abuse or obvious abuse or neglect, then our first response probably should to really be some critical thoughts about, you know, how can we provide support to this family? How can we um, talk to them about what they might be needing at this point in time? And once you've exhausted those efforts, certainly, you know, if it, uh, if it looks like neglect, obviously report it. Um, but I, I think we shouldn't always just go to picking up the phone when we see a family struggling. Uh, because I think then it has unintended consequences of that family's not going to let you know the next time um, if they're struggling. And, and it's, that's the opposite of prevention. There was a word that Chris had said earlier that, that really stood out to me, and it was comfort. And so the way that things are set up right now, and, and this is what I want like professionals like Jeff and Rainey to be aware of, is that even if you have the best solution, the best services, the number one program, you know, financial support to offer someone, when you have that power that what's at stake is that child could be out of your, you could lose your child. It's not easy to accept what you need when you know that that's what ultimately at stake. Like Jeff was talking about the lady that she left the house. I mean, that's a lot of pressure. 
to know like, if I don't answer Mr. Jeff's calls, if I am late, if I you know she, she might have needed to get public transportation to get to the meeting and if the bus was running late or whatever, it's just that pressure that maybe, you know, and, and not speaking on that situation, but just in general, that maybe that you're trying your best, but now it's just, you just don't feel like it's really helped because th that's what's the ultimate consequence. If there is any mistake from here on out, you know, I could lose my child. And so I, I really liked, you know, Krista talking about some of the changes and really, you know, approaching situations differently instead of just one size fits all, you know, investigation. I don't use that word, but I mean, it's kind of what it's been like. Um, because another unintended consequence, I, I hope that people can relate to this feeling because this just happened to me yesterday. <laughs> but, you know, I'm driving down the road and I wasn't doing anything wrong. I was following the rules of the road, but a police car came behind me. And then I'm like, oh, no, hopefully my lights are on and I did a turn signal. And now it's like I'm overthinking it so much that I think I might be going over the line a little bit. And I'm like, oh, now I'm going to get pulled over because now I'm breaking the rules. And, and that's kind of what it feels like um, when people are watching, even if they are well-meaning and they're offering you services. And so I think that's really important, just letting people know, like Rainey has talked about partnering with families. Like we are on the same playing field. We are all, I'm, I'm with you. I am your family too. I am your cousin now. We're, we're just helping the kids and helping you. I think that, you know, trying to be understanding that, yeah, you do hold power over somebody and if they are not accepting services all the time, even then it may not be because they don't want to have a thriving family. It just may, it's, you know, the fear of, of what's at stake. And I think that could also help moving forward is that not being an option, not, not letting people know that their child is going to stay in their home when they get the services their child is staying. I love that the point you made Valerie about making sure there's not a sense of um, power differential between parent and, and partner, whether it's a school, an agency, a therapist, that um, it should be a partnership and not, I'm the expert, I know what to do because I, I'm a parent too. Um, and I've messed up a lot um, and struggle. And so, that feeling of being watched would make you struggle more. Like it's not helpful um, in any way. So feeling like it's a partnership is, is just so important. But to do that from the outset, you've got to look at the parent as an expert and, and let them know you see them as the expert on their child um, rather than the other way around. I'm an expert because of my job or my degree. Um, that's, that's not the case. That is awesome. And it, and one thing that I'm, I'm hearing uh, in common with everybody is partnerships and it's, it's building, building those relationships saying, hey, if you don't win, I don't win. Like when we win, we're going to win together. If we're going to lose, we're going to lose together, but we're not going to lose. Losing is not an option here. This is what we're going to do. Um, like everybody, you know, we got many parents that are watching and, and panelists that are parents. It's the same thing. It's like, you know, we want to do what's best for the family, for the child, but we're going to do this together. And I will never walk in and say, hey, I am an expert. I will always share my experiences and I'm always going to use empathy because I'm going to say, if it was me in this position, how would I feel? You know, what kind of support would I want? Uh, um, not coming in too hot and heavy, but just at the right pace. And, and it may take more than one visit, more than one conversation, but it's being consistent and being available for that family to say, listen, um, you know, it's a situation in school or Johnny came in, didn't have any socks on this day and the third. Don't even worry about it. I got a pair of socks in here. But if you need this situation, please reach out and call me so we can take care of this. And then um, on the other side, and this is a whole I know we're going to be running out of time. I've had. And, excuse me, I've had family members call the report line and that was constantly. It was the mom calling on the daughter because she didn't like the daughter's lifestyle or the daughter's boyfriend or whatever the case was. And that was just kind of like, oh my gosh. It's like, 
you know, I come in and say, hey, there was a report. I already know who made the report. My mom made the report. I can't tell you who made the report, but you pretty, pretty much know who made the report. And then it's just building that partnership and that gaining that level of trust. So we've got like two to three minutes left. And I, I know that we, we got a question in the chat um, and then a, a question sent directly. And, and one of them, one of the questions was around like how much, you know, how much time do you give a parent, uh, like how much support, how much time before you're like, I, I gotta make a report, like this is, um, and, and then also how do you support somebody who has to make that report? And how do you, like, how do you kind of bring that around for, you know, fear of retaliation? And then, uh, so we've got three minutes. If somebody would like to respond to that, and then I would also like everyone to kind of share one key takeaway from this whole conversation before we close out. So that's a lot, but if anyone could respond to that and then share your takeaway. I'll, re I'll respond really quickly to the first part. I don't really think it's necessarily um, a length of time, like how much time do you let it go on? Certainly if we're talking about abuse, if we're talking about physical abuse or sexual abuse, it's zero amount of time. Re please report that immediately. That That's not really what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, provide, trying to provide additional supports to families. I think what we're talking about when we talk about that is we're talking about that gray area really between poverty and neglect. And I think that our new definition is really going to help with that. If a family is struggling with, you know, concrete supports, with financial issues, with, you know, having adequate clothing, food, I think there's lots of opportunity for support there. Um, and I do, I'm not going to be able to give an answer that is appropriate to every circumstance because every circumstance has um, its own details, but, you know, if a family takes advantage of those resources that are offered to them um, and it, you know, alleviates that situation, then obviously a report wasn't needed. So I don't think it's necessarily about the length of time. And again, just a clarification is we're, we're kind of talking about that gray area uh, between poverty and neglect, mostly when we're having these conversations. Um, I also, I appreciate everything that was said about the working in partnership because, you know, um, uh, the uh, like uh, taking away what was once a supportive relationship again it, that that sort of is the opposite of um, prevention I know there are certain circumstances you know where that gets a little bit tricky and probably more so if it's a family member so if you're a grandparent and you see concerns about your grandchild um, you know letting the parent know that you're reporting that you may fear that then you're not going to see your grandchild if nothing comes of that so I think that there are circumstances that are different I think you know some of the guidance that we've given is not is not one size fits all um, in particular circumstances and details need to be taken into consideration um, as well but as often as possible you know if we can just be thoughtful about how we continue to be supportive and work in partnership with families um, and respect families and uh, you know, their own knowledge and expertise on, you know, what their family needs and what's best for their own family, um, while still keeping in mind safety, I think that's really important. I would say for time frame and family, just to kind of lump them both together, I think it's important to be cognizant of what you're ultimately trying to do. Because if you're giving your neighbor or a relative time to see if it's something like you don't like how much TV the child is watching. Is that worth not having a severed relationship with your grandchildren? Is that really worth, because if you want that child to watch less TV, but then you have them removed from their parents, is, is the trauma of not having your mom or dad in your life worth a SpongeBob? Like, you know, so like Krista said, there, you know, there's there's black and white situations. Obviously, yes, you need to call if there if there's serious uh, abuse going on. Obviously, um, but if it's something you don't like this or that, I mean, is it worth it? And you know, as I talked earlier about unintended consequences, are those unintended consequences to the family worth it? So that's I would say that's the judgment call you would make as far as if if it's worth it. Um, the relationship, you know, if if it's a family member. Yeah, you may not, they may not want you around. So is the situation you're calling on worth jeopardizing your involvement in their life? Maybe you don't like TV at their house, but when they come to your house, you read books with them. So you're the one that offers the books. You're the one that offers the education time. Um, and I would say just as a final takeaway, and Jeff talked about this, um, 
just slow down, you know? And I, I think everyone's had that drilled into them to, to call, to call. If you suspect something, call. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to get that out of your head. And, you know, if you suspect the black and white situation, yes, call. But Otherwise, just take the time to get to know people. Just that extra minute or two, you know, Rainey's uh, educator um, at drop off, say hi, how are you doing to the parent? Don't just take the kid and start mocking, marking off attendance and keep going. Just take an extra time to, to talk to anyone that you're around. Talk to your neighbor, talk to your, your clients. Um, if you suspect something, but you don't have anything founded, you suspect something that's not immediately reportable, just have a conversation. You know, and without judgment, just talk to them. A lot of times people will tell on themselves if you talk to them long enough, they may start saying, oh my gosh, this morning, it was so rough. You know, we were trying to get out the house and we were running late and I couldn't get the shoes on. And, you know, that, that then you find out. So just slow down, I would say. Excellent. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, everybody. Um, my, my takeaway is, of course, um, I'm not the be all, say all. I've worked in many avenues, but it has all revolved around people. So it's the relationships. And what I've learned and what I continue to utilize is building these relationships with the teacher, with the daycare provider. Um, you know, of course, you can't just go into the doctor's office and without a release and get information there. But, you know, anybody that can give you some insight to what's going on on top of what the parent is telling you to try to support them. But when it's black and white, uh, I tell them in a heartbeat, if it's a bruise or if it's something, I am going to make a report. But going back to what I'm saying is the preventive part is like, hey, did you talk to the teacher? Did you uh, understand? OK, they go to therapy and is, you know, the child is autistic and so forth. Like Valerie said, just take a minute, not long, just take a minute and slow down and, and look at some different options versus saying, let me just pick up this phone and make a report because you could be doing more harm than good. Um, I, really to piggyback off of everything that's just been said to me in summary, it is, it's not our role to police families. It's our role to partner and communicate and collaborate with the end goal being that that child, that youth, that family um, is stable. And it may not be the definition of what we think um, a family should look like or function like, but if it's, if the basic needs are being met and safety is in place, um, then we, we have the ability to know that because we've communicated and we've partnered and collaborated. I don't know if I said my one takeaway, so I'll, I'll jump in again. I'm not sure that I can say anything uh, better than what the others have already said, um, but I agree um, completely. I think that, you know, we have to acknowledge families as the experts in their own experience. I think if we had more empathy in the world, um, then, you know, we could get to a place where we're truly uh, preventing traumatic experiences for children and families. Um, I think more empathy and, and less uh, judgment and really think about uh, be thoughtful about what do our communities need uh, for families to not have the challenges that they have today. If we could focus on those things um, more, I, I think certainly we could get to a place that fewer reports, um, you know, to the child protection agency are necessary in the future, um, and, and children and families would just be better off. jump in here and just close us out. Um, so I'm Debbie Abreu with Kentucky Youth Advocates. And um, I just want to say we have named this conversation today Courageous Conversations. And I so appreciate this group coming together for a really transparent conversation. Um, we appreciate all of the panelists giving their insights um, on the importance of building relationships. We know that reporting is difficult. Um, and the goal of reporting is to keep families intact while keeping kids safe. Um, and we also recognize that parenting is hard, and we know that supporting parents and caregivers um, that we're helping prevent child abuse. So a special thank you to Cozier Charities for supporting Face It's work. 
And we also just want to highlight real quickly an upcoming event on Thursday, April 28th at 12 p.m. Um, we're going to be hosting its uh, Survivor's Healing Journey that we're going to hear from survivors about their healing journey and ways to support them um, individually and as a community. So, and we'll be sending a follow-up email with the recording of this conversation along with some other resources and feel free to share, share that with uh, your networks. So thank you so much for joining us today and hope you have a great day.